So good evening, everyone. Welcome to the day two of our uh, course of PCOS online course through OIAH. I hope everyone had been uh, has benefited by the day one lecture, which was yesterday by me. Today we are having our day two that will be discussing about the pathology of uh, PCOS. What are the various causative? agents, what are the various symptoms, all that will be discussed in detail by our today's lecturer, that is Dr. Manisha Yadav. As I told yesterday, Dr. Manisha Yadav is a senior homeopathic consultant and has been posted in a government homeopathic medical uh, hospital uh, as a clinical consultant there. And she has been working as an online consultant also for Avishkar Homeo Clinic. She uh, enjoys teaching and has been uh, taking lectures for various competitive examination students who are aspiring to become homeopaths or aspiring to become some other medical institutes they want to join. She has been a very great uh, motivation for all of them. And she has been involved in teaching UG and PG students in various different institutions. So I would like to give today's uh, mic to Dr. Manisha. Dr. Manisha, I'll be giving you the, the uh, mic now. And please, you can share your screen. I'll stop sharing mic. Good, in, good evening, all of you, and thank you, Shilpi ma'am, for the nice description. Uh, since we are discussing about the PCOS, and yesterday we learned a lot about the PCOS, only I am just briefing what we learned in the last lecture, then I will proceed to the etiology, pathology, and the various aspects of the PCOS. I think uh, it is very clear to all of you what is the difference between the PCOS and PCO, PCOD, which was nicely explained by Dr. Shilpi ma'am. And only in short, I just want to define it PCOS. Uh, PCOS earlier, it was considered as a endocrine disorder. Uh, but nowadays, it's not only an uh, endocrine disorder, it is also a physiological and psychological involvement of disease. Because since it is a syndrome, it has a various areas of affection and not only it's affecting the ovary, not only affecting the endocrinological system, but it is also affecting the psychology of the female and the physiology of the female. So, I'm extremely excited and uh, about the conversation that we have lined up for you. And uh, I hope this week will be a, a very informative session for all of you. And uh, this is the first picture before I'll start PCOS. Uh, I think every one knows who are Indians about this Bollywood celebrities. And uh, if anyone can tell, what is the relevance of uh, showing this slide here? 
how you look do you have any knowledge all of them are uh, mm -hmm. um, basically they have turned into uh, a lean and thin body now <laughs> <laughs> and as I know, Sarah Ali Khan who has diagnosed with PCOS. That's why she gained so much weight. <coughs> she did the liposuction for that. Correct, correct. Yes. All of them, all of them are patients suffering from PCOS. So either um, so uh, either Sarah Ali Khan, this uh, Karina, Shruti Hashan, Sonam Kapoor they have history of PCOS and they are now explaining and they are sharing their experience with their difficulties having putting weight and having this PCOS disease and how they are fighting it how they are uh, taking different management besides medication and they are able to convert into a healthy body weight so each and everyone knows that in PCOS, there is a abundant weight gain. So what comes in your mind when you think of the PCOS? Whenever someone says PCOS, definitely an obese woman with a lots of acne on the face, with a history of the irregular periods, having the facial hair, that is the hirsutism, with a, with a uh, if she is a, in reproductive stage, then she will complain of the infertility and uh, might they come with you with a lots of investigation in which the testosterone or various androgen levels were raised and this is a classical picture of PCOS. So what's going wrong in this PCOS as the name suggests it is a polycystic ovarian syndrome so ovary contain multiple cystic like structures which is visualized under ultrasonic image. And you can see here, which, which we already learned yesterday, that out of many primordial follicles, few of them start developing in each cycle. And out of them, only one is able to become the dominant, which is considered as a mature follicle or the uh, dominant follicles. And when it reaches at optimum size then it will ovulate and this ova will release which is then captured by this fallopian tube and if the ova will get sperm it will fertilize there and if it will not so lucky to get the sperm then it will degenerate now this is the normal and after ovulation the remnant of the follicle is a corpus medium which degenerates within 14 days now this cycle is always fixed after ovulation it will degenerate in 14 days so whatever be the irregular cycle whatever be the uh, menstrual cycle whether it is less than 26 it will less than uh, 21 or it will be more than 35 days 40 days whatever be the cycle this post ovulation period is always constant so you are uh, uh, those who have be a beginner very easily related with that determination of ovulation time. We can easily determine the ovulation time from the LMP. So whenever the menses occur, just before 14 days ovulation had been occurred. So this cycle is always fixed and this is variable. So if the cycle is of 40 days, so when will the, when will be the ovulation occur? At what day? Anyone? If the patient give a history of cycle of 40 days, so when will ovulation occur? When was the time or duration? At what day this ovulation had been occurred? Ma'am, 26 days. 
how many uh, data 14 days from this we will get 26 it means on day 26 ovulation occur and what we have learned earlier we learned ovulation occur at day 14 see it, it, it is 28 day cycle ovulation will occur at 14th day but if the cycle is variable or irregular if it is more than 28 30 or whatever be the oligomenorrhea then the ovulation period is after ovulation corpus luteum formation and degeneration it took around 14 days and this is always fixed what happening in the polycystic ovary what happens which already we discussed in the previous lecture that these follicles they will reach at a certain stage but they will not ovulate so there is a multiple in each cycle in many follicles will reaches to certain age at the immature follicular stage but they will not ovulate so they remain inside the ovary as a cystic appearance and this keep on changing and keep on cycle going on and no none of the follicles ovulate so there is a collection of this immature follicles inside the ovary and this gives the appearance of polycystic or pearl like appearance in the ultrasonology Now, this is the brief description. Now, the main topic which I am going to explain in this lecture is about the etiology, pathophysiology, clinical presentation, and diagnostic criteria. This is the four major aspects we are going to discuss in this session. Now, first, the causation. Since it is a very older disease, because Steen Leventhal, he diagnosed it around 100 years back, but still the causation of this disease is not clear. It is still unclear what causes this disease. But besides, there are many risk factors or associated factors which were evolved through this uh, duration. And it was found that there are multiple factors which are responsible for development of this disease not a single factor you can't say that only genetic is responsible for this disease or you can say if you have a bad lifestyle or you have a uh, irregular diet or you have a dietary uh, changes then it will lead to the pcos not only obesity can lead to the pcos so it is a multifactorial disease in which there is an interplay of the various component which causes the development of tissue. We will discuss each causation one by one. First is genetic. How it is genetically related? Now it has been seen that genetic definitely plays very vital role in the development of PCOS and different researches and studies show that there is a very high risk of PCOS in first degree related. If there is history of the PCOS in mother, there is some connection issue. So, uh, am I audible to all of you? Uh, visible to all of you? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, I'm just telling about this genetic reason. It has been seen that this PCOS is more related to certain genes. And with the advancement of the technology, in the future, they might get the particular gene which is responsible for this disease. But it has been seen in various studies that there is a very high connection with the first degree relative. First degree relative means if the mother is having PCOS, there is a greater chances of developing PCOS in her daughter. So there is a 50% increased risk of having PCOS in her daughter or in her sister, which is a very close relative. So it has been seen that relative siblings, they might give history of PCOS. They may have a family history. So you can say it is a 
heritability is present in this disease. Now, second evidence which shows that it is related to genetic is that it is even present in in utero condition. That that means it has been seen that this process of the PCOS started even in in utero uterine development when the fetus was inside the womb. Okay, there is a question that is obesity cause PCOD. So I will uh, explain you after I complete this all the causation and then we will give this uh, answer to you. Now, I'm telling that there is a strong relation of development of PCOS in intrauterine life. The perinatal phase, when the fetus is inside the uterus, then she might develop PCOS after birth or in the coming years of her life. And in which patient this is going to be have PCOS, not all the prenatal person will be, all the prenatal fetus will not get this disease, but there are certain high risk person or high risk fetus which have a tendency or predisposition to develop PCOS. And the major risk factor which was found is low birth weight or high birth weight. If the birth weight of the fetus born is low and uh, when will you consider, yeah, which weight is considered as low birth weight? Below 2.5 yes. kg. Normal weight of the newborn baby is above 2.5 kg. If it is less than 2.5 kg, then you can consider it is a low birth weight. So if there is a history of the low birth weight or high birth weight in that patient, in that fetus, there is a chances of development of PCOS postnatally. Postnatally means two to three years, years after her birth, she may become obese. She may develop very early menarche. Or adrenarch. Pubic hair start developing too early. So these conditions may uh, give the sign of PCOS and this may be due to excess androgen or it may be possibility is there that might mother be a PCOS so there is an excess androgen inside the mother which will cause excesses androgen to the fetus and which ultimately leads to the development of PCOS if she is genetically predisposed. So genes is very important if she have a particular genes uh, then only she is able, she will develop this disease. Otherwise, if she is not prone, not susceptible, then there is a less chances of developing this disease. It is also seen that it is common in monozygotic twins. Monozygotic twins. If there is a monozygotic twins, what is monozygotic twins? How it is developed? Monozygote means when egg and sperm fertilizes, zygote was formed and at certain stage of development, it just break down into two and each develop individually. So they both siblings are developed from the same zygote. So they have a genetically very similar to each other. So there is a chances of developing PCOS is also found more if the one of the one of the twins having the PCOS, there is a great chances or great risk of developing PCOS in another one. Next, the environmental factor. Besides this genetic factor, there is certain environmental factor or lifestyle disorder or lifestyle factors which may lead to this disease. Now, one of the important factors which is very common nowadays is sedentation. That is sedentary habit. So there is a lifestyle there, because of this lifestyle, there is an increasing incidence of PCOS nowadays. Not only the sedentary habit, but there is a lot of stress. There is a lot of stress in the form of social stress, in the form of stress 
to excel excel at the academic level at the school level so all these stress either in the children or the different age groups whether it is in um, early age group or reproductive age group or later age group so any type of the stress may precipitate this disease next to environmental factors which is responsible for having this disease is lack of exercise or you can say sedentary habit leads to lack of exercise or lack of exposure to vita to sunlight lack of exposure to sunlight so this sunlight exposure is very essential for vitamin d because vitamin d is very uh, is a sunlight is a source of vitamin d and most of the young girls they are very busy inside the room using different type of gadgets they more prefer indoor game as compared to outdoor game so lack of this exposure to sunlight also lead to this cause so nowadays in the treatment plan in a treatment plan they are giving vitamin d to the patient of the pcos for its treatment along with this smoking and on any addiction can also increase this risk for developing this disease and next factor is dietary habit so the dietary habits of nowadays more or more on the refined sugar less roughage these all dietary habits will lead to the development of pcos so this is the relevance of explaining these etiological causes is that it is very helpful in the management when you know the what are the various causation of disease then only you can prevent it for developing this disease so if these are the causation if you prevent it at very early stages or you can changes do various changes inside inside the patient then definitely disease can be reduced and its complication will not occur or the its long back or its later on consequences can be stopped next reason is neuroendocrine neuroendocrine means uh, usually all the hormonal cycle and the endometrial cycle that is the menstrual cycle is under a control of hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis so hormones from the hypothalamus then stimulates pituitary pituitary stimulates ovary and this are are in synchronized manner so this axis should be intact for the normal functioning of the ovary normal functioning of the uterus so if whenever this hormonal balance become disturbed so disturbance in the hormonal or endocrine function can also lead to this disease so uh, you will see that there is a increased lh in the pcos there is a decreased fsh in the pcos so these are the various hormones abnormality which is reason for developing this disease so in short the genetic predisposition along with various environmental factors with obesity and neuroendocrine factors they all together may contribute to this disease now i'll take the question uh, dr shanvi was asking uh, can a lean patient can also develop pcos right nowadays you have seen uh, you might have seen many cases and you have seen that it is not necessary that all pcos patient are tend to be obese even lean and thin patient are also developing pcos and most of them you can find that there is a truncal obesity most truncal obesity means obesity around the waist this is the most important type of uh, obesity in the females which can lead to various diseases which can lead to insulin resistance which can lead to diabetes even the lean thin patient with a truncal obesity or might or without uh, this obesity can also have a pcos because when i'll go to the next slide we will discuss what will be the causation behind this so the causation behind is the insulin resistance and whatever be the insulin resistance cause it will 
lead to the development of this disease so if patient is lean thin you can say that she might not develop pcos another question is now is it uh, clear to dr shanvi yes ma'am so ma'am is genetic predisposed pcos curable permanently now the you are asking if there is a genetic predisposition is there can be cured these cases yes ma'am yes now i just said that it is not a single reason behind it not only having a genetic reason you will develop the pcos but if you have a healthy lifestyle if you maintain your weight right all the environmental factors which are aggravating this disease is if they are under the tight control you can definitely reverse this disease so it is you have seen that many of the pcos patient are getting cured once the hormonal imbalance are regulated or they become normalized or whatever be the insulin resistance whatever be the other hormonal imbalance if they are regular regularized then definitely ovary will start functioning normally they will not making immature follicles they will start ovulating follicles in each cycle so if the uh, ovary start ovulating follicles ova with each follicle then definitely this condition will not develop okay thank you ma'am uh, next topic is the pathophysiology of pcos now another one you can say so these are the factors now uh, etiology you just know now uh, this genetic predisposition that environmental factor obesity and uh, this hormonal imbalance these are all interplaying in the development of the pcos but what they are doing what are the after effect of this imbalance in the body and which lead to this development in one word you can say excessive androgen production by the ovary is the culprit behind of all this problem so excessive androgen is main reason behind the pcos so why you can ask why this androgen is start why this ovary start producing excess amount of androgen what will be the reason behind it so the reason behind it there are many perspectives were given because since its etiology is not known still now but there are various perspectives were given that there is a either peripheral insulin resistance or imbalance in fsh and lh that will lead to excessive androgen is it clear so in one word you can say the excessive androgen inside female is responsible for development of all signs and symptom which you can see in pcos and why this androgen become excess inside the body because of insulin resistance that is the peripheral insulin insulin resistance or because of imbalance of hormones now we will discuss this so there is a two perspective behind this increase androgen by the ovary one insulin resistance and imbalance in fsh and lh level they both lead to excessive androgen production by the ovary the first is how insulin resistance increases in increase amount of androgen production by ovary okay how excessive insulin resistance can lead to development of androgen excess in the body because you have to know that androgen excess is the major major cause behind this and how this androgen become excess and how why ovary start producing excess amount of androgen what is the pathology behind it and what are the imbalance going inside the body which can causes increased level of androgen in the body 
so the first main reason is the insulin resistance what do you mean by insulin resistance insulin resistance means pancreas is secreting insulin but this insulin is not able to be enter inside the cell because these insulin receptors which are present at the surface of the cell are irresponsible they are irresponsive they are not able to sense this so this insulin is not able to be bound or they can enter inside the cell for to carry out its function and you know the major function of insulin is to convert the excess glucose in blood into the glycogen so to get the energy you have to storage of the energy so because of this resistance of this insulin because of this resistance there is increased amount of insulin level in the blood okay because insulin is continuously produced by the pancreas because there is no problem in the pancreas pancreas is perfectly fine it's functioning normal it's secreting hormone insulin but this insulin is not able to be uptake by the cell cell is not able to utilize this insulin so its level inside the blood increases and this lead to the hyperinsulinemia excess of the insulin in the blood so what will this causes what what will be the effect of this excessive insulin in the blood agar hamare blood pe excessive insulin hai so how will it affect the various organ or how will it affects the ovary there is a two ways through which this excessive insulin in the blood affected or they can lead to increase in androgen firstly this excessive insulin will cause hyperplasia of the theca layer of the ovary as as you know in the ovary or inside the follicle ovarian follicle there is a oocyte and which is surrounded by the granulosa and its outer layer is the theca cell this is the lining of the graafian follicles or dominant follicles and this theca cell is major area for the production of androgen so inside the ovary androgen is formed in theca cell is it clear so whenever there is excessive hyperplasia of this theca cell what will happen more and more androgen will form so the level of androgen increased because of excessive insulin in the blood it stimulates ovary especially theca layer of the ovary or especially follicles theca layer or theca cell of the follicles which causes excessive production of the androgen and you uh, you might have learned in gynec classes that uh, this excesses androgen is formed through conversion of the cholesterol into progesterone androstenedione and this is a various conversion which you already know that but you have to remember that because of excessive stimulation of this theca layer there is excessive production of the androgen see so this is the one way through which increasing insulin resistance increasing insulin level leading to excessive increased androgen in the body now the second affection or second base through it affected or through which it incre increases androgen is its action on the liver what does it do this excessive insulin will cause decrease sex hormone binding globulin what is sex hormone binding globulin anyone okay i'll tell you in the blood uh, there is a certain plasma protein which is destined or responsible to carry the androgen to carry the androgen from the site of origin to the site of action okay because all hormones are formed at somewhere and they can utilize at some another site similarly androgens so formed at uh, either in the ovary or in the adrenal gland they can travel through this 
sex hormone binding globulin and then reaches to the site of its action so function of this excessive insulin is that insulin normally dick sex hormone binding globulin in the blood so more or more insulin in the blood more and more this decrease in sex hormone binding globulin what does it means literally it means whatever androgen or whatever the sex hormones which are produced in the body they are 90% they are bounded to sex hormone binding globulin 98% around only 1 or 2% of it are free free androgen or they are in the free form and this free form of androgen is only potential to do all its function so only active form of androgen is this 1 to 2% more the 1 to 2% more will the action of androgen occur so what will going on because of excessive insulin liver start decreasing sex hormone binding globulin so what will the effect if the sex hormone binding globulin get decreased so the amount of free androgen will what will happen either increase or decrease increase ma'am increase so the unbounded form of androgen which is not bounded to sex hormone binding globulin they are increased so again what happened there is a increased level of androgen so not only ovaries is start increasing androgen even liver also by decreasing sex hormone binding globulin increases concentration of androgen inside the blood so they cumulative they collectively increases androgen level in the blood which is the main culprit behind the pcos is it clear yes ma'am so we can summarize what we have learned just now whenever there is a resistance of the insulin there is hyperinsulinemia which can increase androgen level by two ways either increasing androgen secretion from the ovary by stimulating fecal cell of the ovary which cause excessive androgen and as you learn in the last lecture there are various type of androgen Uh, like androstenedione testosterone dheas these are the various androgens which are present in the female and they are all in different percentage they are secreted from the ovary and because of this stimulation this androgen increases in the blood another way is that by decreasing sex hormone binding globulin the in amount of free androgen in the blood increases so more and more androgens are available in the blood and what this androgen will going to do in the body how does it affect we will discuss it later but first we are trying to get the causes or ways to which androgen are increasing in the body so one reason or one perspective is the in peripheral insulin resistance which is leading to the increase androgen in the body is it clear till now is there any query Okay. Ma'am, basically, yeah. what causes insulin resistance? कि ये सारी yes, चीजें yes. insulin resistance से हो रही हैं लेकिन insulin resistance क्यों हो रहा है? Right. Now, uh, if we discuss what will be the cause of insulin resistance, right? now the insulin resistance they have a various causes behind it not a single like uh, just like pcos and there is a multi factors which are involving in development of disease similarly insulin resistance have a various reasons which may lead to the development of this resistance and there are the certain risk factors for insulin resistance and it may be either increase abdominal obesity मनीष 
Am I audible now? Yes, you are. Okay. Now the insulin resistance, why this insulin resistance going on? Uh, it still has a many reasons behind it, not a single factor same here, like increased abdominal obesity will lead to the resistance. Then if there is a family history of type 2 diabetes mellitus, that is non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. If there is a, some genetic predisposition, they are all the factors are almost same genetic predisposition. Certain aging factors will lead to the insulin resistance. Certain drugs are there, steroids and drugs, which can lead to the insulin resistance. They all have a, are the risk factors for insulin resistance. So this insulin resistance, as you learn now, can lead to PCOS. This is the one condition. Okay. Insulin resistance can lead to one condition that is PCOS. It can also lead to increase, uh, it can also affect the liver. Okay, whenever insulin resistance, it also affects the liver, so causes a decreased sex hormone binding globule. They can also uh, uh, affect the adrenal gland. So we, this insulin resistance can have effect on various organ systems. That's why in PCOS, because of this insulin resistance, not only ovary are getting affected of uh, having a irregular menses and all these features, but along with this, uh, patient always also developing diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, other organs are all, also involved because of this insulin resistance. That's why this disease is a syndrome, not a single disease or single or sphere of action, but it also cause or it can also affect various organ system also. Is it clear now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Any more questions? So now we come to another perspective of increase androgen is the imbalance in FSH and LH. And you all know this hypothalamus secretes GnRH which stimulate pituitary, which secrete FSH and LH, and they will cause formation of estrogen and the progesterone. So where is its main action? This FSH always acts at granulosa cell, and this LH always acts on this theca cell. So because this theca cell has a receptor for LH, and granulosa cell has a receptor for FSH, and they coordinately causes development of the follicles and whenever there is a surge of LH, LH surges, ovulation occurs and after ovulation, the corpus luteum so formed, so uh, corpus luteum so formed, it secreted which hormone? Progesterone. And during this phase, follicular phase, it secreted estrogen majorly along with progesterone for small amount, but mainly it secretes estrogen. So this will lead to the normal HPO axis and normal cycle. So in the ovary, there is a development of follicles, ovulation, corpus luteum, and in the uterus, what's going on? There is a proliferation of the endometrial layer. Then after ovulation, when the luteal phase comes, there is a secretory phase inside the uterus. And when both degenerate, when the corpus luteum degenerated, there is the absence of estrogen and progesterone. So there is a withdrawal of the estrogen and the progesterone, which will cause this menstrual or flow of the, or uh, shedding of the endometrial lining. So for the shedding of the endometrial lining or for the menses, it is very essential that there must be withdrawal of hormone is very important. 
withdrawal of hormone menses always came with the reason behind is withdrawal of hormone if there is a continuous presence of hormone in inside the blood inside the body then menses will never occur so you might have seen in several cases in those cases patient want medications for delaying menses they just we put on various estrogen and progesterone hormones for particular days till she they don't want to have menses and then when they want they just withdraw the hormone they stop taking medicine and after stop take after withdrawal of the medicine when the hormones they was goes down then menses appear or the shedding of the endometrium appears so this is normal physiology of the menstrual cycle and there is a great harmony in between the hormones which are secreted from the pituitary hormones which are secreted from the ovary and its action on the endometrium they are all in coordination what was going wrong in pcos what happened in the pcos there is a increase in frequency of this gnrh gnrh become disturbed what the cause it is still not clear but this gnrh level increases in the body and which causes stimulation of both fsh and nh so it stimulates pituitary pituitary will stimulate fsh and the lh but lh cell are more responsive this they are more responsive to this change in frequency or increase in frequency so there is a relative increase in lh as compared to fsh fsh is not decreasing but because lh is getting more higher in the blood as compared to fsh so their ratio altered lh and fsh ratio changes normally there is one is to two ratio means fsh is greater than lh but because of this change in frequency of this release of gnrh there is more lh as compared to fsh so this ratio is changed from 2 to 1 3 is to 1 whatever we but majorly there is a change in ratio of fsh and lh level so what's the what does it affect how does it affect when this level changes so when this fsh level decreases and you all know what is the function of fsh it stimulate the follicles to grow to the maturity so it can ovulate so if this amount is relatively low in the body so what will happen the follicle will not mature to the point it can ovulate they are increased in size but at a certain stage but they will not reach at the stage where it can ovulate so because of the low fsh they are not able to follicles are not able to ovulate that's why these follicles can they remain present inside the ovary as a cystic form now what will happen because of this excess lh this excess lh as i told in the previous slide this lh acts on the thecal layer and this thecal cell layer will produce androgen so more and more excess or more and more amount of lh which is secreted because of this abnormality this more excess lh stimulate thecal cell to produce excess amount of androgen so again what happening because of increased lh there is a more stimulation of thecal layer or thecal cell of the follicle which ultimately lead to excessive production of androgen so it again this perspective also shows that there is a increased level of the androgen either through the insulin resistance this androgen are going to increased or because of this imbalance is this hormone or due to excessive lh can lead to development of excess androgen in the blood is it clear till now yes ma'am ma'am if you want to add something more no actually i was wondering why you were not there when we were studying you have explained it so nicely <laughs> thank you ma'am 
Yeah, it, uh, it was really very, very informative, very detailed and very properly explained, Dr. Manisha. Yes. And it's all your blessings and our seniors' blessings. You can go ahead, Dr. Manisha. Okay, ma'am. Now next, all of the conditions like LH or FSH imbalance or insulin resistance is finally leading to increased androgen. So how this excess androgen affects you, affects PCOS patient, what this excess androgen will disturbs in the body. First of all, because of this increased androgen, so since ovaries start increasing excess amount of androgen, and this excess androgen should be normalized in the body. So in order to uh, normalize it or it maintain at the optimum level, this excess androgen start getting peripheral aromatization into estrone. Estrone, which is known as E1, is a form of estrogen. As you all know, estrogen, they are occurring in three forms, is E1, E2, and E3. These are the various forms of the estrogen. Uh, even is known as estrone, E2 is estradiol, and this is the most potent form. So, we talk about the important estrogen, which we usually talk about the and its various uh, functions or various function of the estrogen, which we used to learn is about the estradiol, E2. And third is estriol. But mainly even is formed due to the conversion of androgen in the peripheral or in the adipose tissue into even. So in the body, if there is an even is present, if you go for this test, estrogen is strong even and it is increased, it means there is a more and more androgen are getting aromatized into estrone. So there is a, some way there is excessive androgen is present in the body. And the, because of this excessive estrone in the body, there is a chronically elevated estrogen level. So continuously, your estrogen level is increased. They are always in state of increased level. And what will happen? Whenever there is an increased level of, chronically increased level of the estrogen, it will increase LH. What will, uh, going to happen? It increased LH. Because estrogen has positive feedback on LH. Whenever there is an increased amount of estrogen, it stimulates or it increases LH level. So whenever there is a chronic elevation of this estrogen level in the body, it will lead to excessive LH or their increased LH. So in the body, there is continuous increased level of LH is present. If you can make figure out or through the lines, you can say LH level is can say LH is continuously increased. If it is LH level and if it is FSH level, this level is chronically increased. They are always in state of increased level in the blood. So what will happen for the ovulation? What we require is LH surge. LH surge means there must be a peak or higher level of LH is required suddenly, which will lead to ovulation. But what happening? There is a constant elevation of the, there is a constant, not surging. Surging for, surging means earlier it has a lower and suddenly there is an increased LH level. If that condition occur, then only LH surge will lead to the ovulation. For the ovulation, this LH surge is required. It should be higher level from the baseline level. Whatever be the baseline level LH is present, if it goes on suddenly increased, that is called LH surge. And this surge will lead to ovulation. Here, what happening? Because of this increased level of LH and there is a no surge, there is no ovulation. So, the condition developed is an ovulation. Here, because of this excess androgen, there is conversion of this excess androgen in the adipose tissues, in the, uh, in the muscles, in the liver, into the estrone. And This can cause increased level of estrogen and because of increased level of estrogen, there is an increased LH and there is no LH surge, so there is no 
ovulation. So someone asks, can homeopathy changes the HPO axis in hormonal level in PCOS? I think this answer will be better explained by Dr. Deepak Sharma sir, because this is her, his field where the uh, medicine, how medicine are changing this axis. And definitely it will help uh, according to me because all this HPO axis is somehow related to mind. So if we make psychology in uniform way, in a proper alignment, in a correct way by regulating its um, dietary habit, by regulating its psychological status, by regulating its environmental factors. So definitely it will correct this hormonal imbalance. So because this HPO axis is a type of functional, there is nothing pathology is there. So wherever there is a functional cause behind any disease, and it is definitely very good. Uh, the, that type of cases are responded very well with homeopathy. So according to me, uh, definitely it will do. But uh, uh, this, uh, I think, it, Deepak sir, I think is not there. Yes, I am here. Uh, sir, uh, sir, sir, but please uh, explain. But, but, yeah, but uh, what I suggest, you just complete yes, your sir. session. Then okay. I will explain each and everything. Do not worry. Okay. I, I will okay. tell uh, everyone about the significance of this pathology. Why we are reading the LH, why we are reading the FSH, why we are reading the so many kind of the hormones. So I will tell you each and everything, but you should, you are doing the best in your pathology. So please complete your session first. Okay. So uh, that part will be later on discussed by the Dr. Deepak Sarma sir. But presently, I'm going to explain how this increased androgen affecting the various systems or various part of the body. So one way is this excessive androgen will cause anovulation. Because of high androgen, there is condition anovulation developed. So there is no periods or there is a irregular menses. How will that occur? How anovulation leads to irregular menses? We will discuss it later on. In next affection is because of this increased androgen in the body, this will cause excess proliferation of small enteral follicle. Small enteral follicle means like the primordial follicles which start developing or growing. These small enteral follicles will get more and more proliferated because of this excess androgen. That's why in PCOS there is a multiple follicles are growing at the same time. Uh, they are not reaching at the dominant stage, but they are increasing in number. That's why in ultrasound, you will see this type of pattern. There is a multiple cyst, which is a like pearl, uh, like in the necklace, there is a pearl. This type of appearance, which is a classical presentation of PCO, will appear. And this will lead to the arrest, maturation arrest. So all the follicles which are in early stages they keep on growing they are keep on proliferating but none of them reaches to the stage of maturity and this will lead to the develop uh, disturbed follicular growth and that's why this polycystic ovary or polycystic ovary morphology or pattern present in the ultrasound so polycystic ovary is again because of increased androgen and these is increased androgen they causes excessive proliferation of small, small enteral follicles which are present in the ovary and they're preventing them to reach the maturity. So this is the effect of androgen excess in the body. It will lead to the anovulation. It can lead to the polycystic ovary morphology. Now, what will be the effect of this anovulation? So androgen excess will lead to the anovulation. So how this anovulation affects the menstrual cycle of the female. So it may present in various form as uh, you have learned in the last lecture, there is an irregular menses either in the form of the flow, either in the form of the cycles or days. 
this anovulation will cause amenorrhea because since there is a no ovulation only follicles are growing so what will happen in the ovary follicles are secreting what estrogen excess of estrogen are increasing there is a proliferation of the uterine lining and they will not shedding so patient will give history of the amenorrhea then they may present as a oligomenorrhea oligomenorrhea means delayed history means history in history that menses appears in 40 days 50 days in 2 months and there is a various criteria which were given that a, a, it is very normal if there is a less than four cycle in a year if there in 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 a 12 months only four cycles are coming in the first year of the puberty it is a normal you don't have to do anything and similarly there are the various number of cycles which is related to the that age of the life so it may present as amenorrhea may present as oligomenorrhea and oligomenorrhea means delayed menses which is more than 35 days and it may lead to menorrhagia also what is menorrhagia means profuse bleeding by there is a bleeding is profuse because of excess endometrial lining there is a more proliferation so whenever there is a withdrawal is withdrawal hormone occur there is a more and more shedding of the uterine lining so more or the shedding of the lining more and more bleeding will occur so it may be more than 7 days bleeding will excess amount flow will be there so classically patient will present with history of oligomenorrhea will say that menses come after 35 40 days and but whenever it comes it is always very profuse because of this anovulatory cycle so by this topic by this uh, description now you can easily relate the reason why the females have any irregular menstrual cycle because of excessive androgen and androgen includes all thing uh, testosterone dheas androstenedione and these excessive androgen again prevents ovulation they will cause anovulation or hormonal imbalance lhfs disturbance also prevents the maturation and ovulation and they will all lead to collection of this immature follicles inside the ovary and finally uterus will not get that signal to set the lining and then this is the immediate effect but since this insulin resistance are causes chronic anovulation chronic androgen excess so it has a affection on various organ it may cause infertility because ovulation is not there there is no egg no fertilization infertility will occur then endometrial carcinoma why because there is unbounded increase in endometrial lining so it become cancerous so these are the cases are usually occur in later stage then it may insulin resistance can lead to diabetes can lead to obesity metabolic syndrome metabolic syndrome is diabetic hypertension all the combination of this diseases cause they are called metabolic syndrome then because of liver is also affecting because of this insulin resistance patient will develop fatty liver so you have find in ultrasonic reports along with pcos there is all most of them has fatty liver of first grade or second grade may present then lipid disturbance will cause cardiovascular affection and they will all affect the psychology so it may cause depression anxiety so by the knowledge of all this pathophysiology now you can easily know its clinical features menstrual irregularities because of excessive androgen all androgenic feature will develop like acne hirsutism alopecia because of this polycystic ovary why ovary become polycystic now as we just explained it overweight so these are the classical clinical feature of pcos so there are certain other disease also which mimic or which can give this excessive androgen like features so you have to first rule out all these causes before diagnosing pcos so you have to because patient will give history of amenorrhea you should rule out rule out through the beta hcg upt urine pregnancy test you should do urine pregnancy test to rule out any pregnancy is there if there is any history of medicine because steroid can also lead to androgen excess if there is any thyroid disease because thyroid also 
presented with similar manifestation like delayed menses, weight gain, all these things. Even prolactin increased hyperprolactinemia. When the prolactin level is increased, there is a galactoria breast from best there is a milk production in non-pregnant females it can also present with the similar manifestations like this and if there is a hypogonadotropic hypogonad in some in some cases there is a deficiency or the defect will present at the level of gnrh so they will also lead to various manifestations so you have to first rule out that therefore pcos is known as the x uh, diagnosis of exclusion you have to exclude other causes then only you can confirm it as pcos and there is a very clear criteria for the diagnosing pcos and it is known as rotterdam criteria according to this there must be a menstrual irregularity which may be amenorrhea or oligomenorrhea there may be excessive androgen either sign or symptom means like acne hirsutism it can be present like this or there is a laboratory findings means there is an increase in testosterone, DHEA level, or uh, all the androgen level. There is a raised in the blood. They will confirm PCOS. And the next criteria is ultrasound. That is more preferably transvaginal TVS will be done. And for TVS to diagnose it at polycystic OB, there must be more than 20 follicles will there. Not only four, five, ten follicles is present, is not considered as PCOS. At least 20 plus follicles should be there to be considered it as PCOS. And all the follicles are very small. They are not very grown up. So their size is less than nine millimeter, between two to nine mm. And there is increased ovarian ball volume overall the volume of the OBS should be increased and this is very important criteria if the volume is more than 10 ml then you can consider it as a PCOS so any of the two criteria is present then it will give the confirmed diagnosis of PCOS if there is a menstrual irregularity with PCOS ovaries then you can consider it it's not essential that in each and every patient you will get all three criteria. If any of the two of any two of them are present, it will definitely diagnose this disease. And uh, finally, nowadays ultrasound should not be used for this diagnosis if there is a age is less than eight years. Because in the younger, if the age less than eight years is there, there is initially there is multifollicle ovaries in early life. Say there are multiple follicles are start growing there and at that phase ovary look like pco polycystic but they will not consider it as pcod because that is a functional condition only if there is an irregular menses and excess of androgen is there then there is no need of any ultrasound so like rotterdam criteria if two out of three is present there is a no need to diagnose or no need to go for any ultrasound and for the ultrasound it is better to go for transvaginal TVS mainly those who are sexually active female in that case not for unmarried ones. So finally we summarize what are the various hormonal changes which are going on and in one way you can say there are certain hormones which are going to increase in the PCOS and there are certain hormones which are going to decrease. So all androgens are increased, estrone are increased inside the blood, insulin is increased. LH level is increased, prolactin is increased. In some cases, not always, hyperprolactinemia may be a different disease, but may be associated with PCOS. And because of imbalance of glucose metabolism, there is a more and more free fatty acid formation is there, that triglyceride formation. So there is a lipid profile is abnormal. And AMH is anti mullerian hormone. This is a hormone which is secreted from the small enteral follicles. More and more small enteral follicles are present in the ovary, more and more AMH is there. So since in this case, in PCOS, you have seen there is a many small, more than 20 enteral follicles are there. So the AMH level is always increased in PCOS, but it is not a criteria for diagnosis, isn't it? Because for the criteria is uh, to diagnose PCOS, it is not included. So AMH is increased in PCOS, but it is a not a definitive criteria for diagnosing PCOS. And there are certain hormones which are going to decrease in PCOS, like FSH decreases, 
because there is no ablation, no corpus luteum, no progesterone, and you know that insulin causes decreased sex hormone binding globulin, so this hormone is also increased, decreases, and all healthy cholesterol also, SDL and apoprotein, they are also decreased in blood. So there is a certain increase in the blood, certain hormones are going to be increased and certain are going to be decreased. Thank you for patient, patient learning, uh, patient listening, and hope it clears your certain doubts. If still you have any doubt, you just write in the chat box. It definitely was a very, very uh, informative and enlightening session. Thank you, Dr. Manisha. I hope everyone would agree. I have seen in the chat box, many people were saying they were really very happy with whatever you have told. No one has given such a detailed uh, session till now about PCOS and explaining about the pathology. Dr. Deepak, you have to say something. Yes, Dr. Manisha, this is really a wonderful session. And I think you wrote uh, four to five books uh, of the pathology to conclude all this. So this is really wonderful. And uh, I, what I want to include that you should know about the LH and FSS level for an PCOS patient and when to investigate it, what was the level and uh, how should you go for the testing. Uh, that I will tell you in my presentation also. But here I uh, include the question uh, from, uh, from CD. Can homeopathy changes the homeopath uh, hypothalamic, hypophysical, gonadical axis in hormone level? Yes, definitely. What uh, I am saying always that the homeopathy is the only science in work that uh, conclude your physical symptom with your mental state. This is the only science which uh, combined your both symptoms together and select a single remedy. So if we are considering the mental state and we are considering the mental symptoms like how uh, a female is going to irritate, how a, the female is having the sleep pattern, then why we cannot change the whole axis? Because this is the important thing we should know about our homeopathic remedies that it can touch your subconscious mind. So have a faith on this homeopathic medicine. It can do the magic. I will show you the cases that how a female change uh, from the mental state to the pathological levels. So that I will tell you uh, in my presentations. Definitely homeopathy can do changes in the whole access. Thank you, Dr. Deepak. So I hope uh, everyone would have uh, taken benefit from today's session. So um, I think with this, we would uh, be winding the session for today. If anyone has any queries, as I said yesterday also, please, if they were not answered in this session or any of the previous or coming sessions, please feel free, free to ask the similar questions on our website or through the uh, Google form or anything, whichever way is available. Uh, so tomorrow we'll be having day three with Dr. Ashish Goel explaining about the, uh, no, sorry, with Dr. Shweta explaining about the miasmatic background of the uh, PCOS and how mias plays a major role in treating it, in uh, causing it. So, um, I hope to see you all tomorrow as well. With this, I'll be winding it up. Have a good day. Sorry, have a good night. <laughs> okay. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Good night, everyone. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Good night.